So I'm Stuart Hayes Saldine. I'm at the University of Edinburgh. I'm a geologist, been interested in, uh, I spent 15 or 20 years getting oil and gas and coal out of the ground is what I like to say. And then I've spent since 2004 trying to get anything to do the ground again. Uh, but I suggested Rupert for this, uh, for this presentation today and because uh, we're all interested in what happens to carbon, what happens to society, how we're going to, are we going to transition through this or not. And one of the things which struck me is by having limited movement and limited economic activity, then this is in a way what a 5% or 7% a year decrease in emissions might start to look like. Mm. So if Extinction Rebellion got their wishes come true, would this be the start of a, an energy descent and of which carbon capture and storage may or may not play a part ultimately? Uh, and the things which strike me are that uh, we have managed to adapt very quickly. We're a very adaptable species, uh, but it's also fairly unpopular because there's been no consultation and as also it, our perspective seems to be very very limited to our particular bit of Europe and if we look if I go to the world still seems that the world is on track for a CO2 emissions increase this year even though in a lot of western countries we've had a decrease temporarily so this shows how hard and difficult decarbonization may actually be so I've invited Rupert because uh, Rupert, I think, is a well-known uh, academic as a reader in philosophy. Uh, so anybody who's into Wittgenstein can go and look that up later on. Uh, but he's also got another two lives as a researcher on the philosophy of natural capital, and in particular as a Green Party uh, activist and candidate, and in particular as a spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion. And a couple of things came out to me is that Rupert can claim the uh, credit for transitioning the BBC away from 50-50 uh, balance in environmental objectors and environmental protagonists. Uh, so, and also Rupert can uh, claim uh, credit for speaking to Michael Gove on the day before the Westminster Parliament declared its climate emergency. Anyway, I'm going to go over to Rupert, and I understand you're probably going to talk for about 20, 30 minutes. No slides, just so listen carefully, everybody. This is proper philosophical deep thought, so you actually pay attention to what the words mean, and you can't look at the pictures. So uh, over to Rupert, and you talk for this however long you want. Uh, we've got an hour usually for the slot, and then, uh, you know, the last 15 minutes of that might be questions and answers, hopefully. Uh, and we some people will stay on the line afterwards and rupert has to go for sure about half past uh, four yeah Preferably great two. yeah you. thank you Stuart, for that kind uh, introduction thanks everybody for coming yeah as um stuart has uh, already indicated there's um more than one way in which my thoughts and expertise whatever might be relevant to what you guys are interested in. So I'll just spend a minute or two about uh, going into a, in a bit more detail uh, who I am to establish that. And then I'm not going to speak for as long as your speakers, I think, usually speak for. I want to just speak for a while, uh, hopefully um, in a thought-provoking way. Uh, and then we'll see what stuff you want to drill down into more um, on the basis of that, because, you know, we could talk for, for days here. Um, uh, and uh, an hour will be a, a short period only. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a philosopher whose interests strongly include um, natural capital, a concept of which I'm somewhat critical, um, the precautionary principle of which I'm uh, extremely um, pro. Um, I've done a lot of work in the philosophy of, uh, of science. Uh, and uh, I also until relatively recently ran a think tank called uh, Greenhouse, uh, which uh, has done a number of things, including uh, publishing this book, uh, Facing Up to Climate Reality, Honesty, Disaster and Hope. Um, as was mentioned, uh, I've been very active since the beginning, pretty much, in Extinction Rebellion. And as was mentioned, one of my roles in Extinction Rebellion has been to do political liaison, which basically means meeting with the government and, and the opposition and so on. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, I was part of the first Extinction Rebellion negotiation team. I organized the meeting with, uh, with Michael Gove, um, which, was, uh, which may have helped to bring in the Climate and Environment Emergency Declaration, which occurred um, the next day. And um, yeah, so, so that's me. Uh, and I'm gonna start out now in terms of substance by saying a few things about um, how bad I think uh, our situation uh, is. Um, obviously, many of you will be incredibly familiar with, uh, with this, but perhaps not so familiar with the, with the angle I put on it in terms of how desperate I think the situation is, which is why those of us who share this kind of analysis um, are part of Extinction Rebellion, really. So we might start out with the question, I'm sure that all of us here on this call share the goal of reaching uh, carbon uh, net zero uh, and hopefully carbon uh, real zero uh, sooner rather than later. The target for which the government legislated uh, is, uh, is 2050. The Extinction Rebellion target is 2025. So we're delighted that the government um, brought in a, a net zero carbon target for the first time. Uh, and uh, it probably wouldn't have happened uh, without us, among other things. Um, but we're not so delighted that it's 2050. So why do we favour a, a far more stringent, indeed eye-watering uh, uh, target, which to many of you may sound uh, unrealistic, and I'll come back to that point in a moment. Well, the simple answer is because 2050 is uh, reckless uh, and 2050 may well mean uh, death, and it certainly will mean death to uh, many people, um, and to most, possibly all, uh, of the coral, to uh, much of the world's uh, rainforest. Um, and once you take out the rainforest, uh, well, then you're in a whole new uh, ball game, um, which probably uh, leads to uh, death to, uh, to many of our children, or at least our grandchildren. Uh, 2050 is uh, an incredibly dangerous uh, target to, to have, to depend upon. Moreover, 2050 will be used as an excuse for prevarication and for geoengineering. Uh, we'll perhaps come back to the geoengineering point in particular. Um, but why 2025? I mean, you might say, okay, so 2050 is not ideal, so let's go for 2040 or 2035 or something. Why 2025? Isn't that a bit extreme? Well, there's a number of answers to, to that question. The first and to me most important answer, and an answer which has been very important to Extinction Rebellion, um, is the precautionary principle about which, as I say, much of my own research in recent years has been um, concerned. Why should we lean on the side of precaution rather than on the side as we have been almost entirely uh, over for the past couple of generations, or a lot longer actually, um, on the side of recklessness? Well, one very concrete reason is because of the over-optimism of, uh, of past models. Some of you will be aware, for example, that in terms of uh, aspects of, uh, of ice melt around the world, um, the so-called worst scenarios of uh, previous models have been uh, exceeded. Um, it's not safe uh, to, to stick by uh, uh, models when uh, what's at play is the entire future of human civilization and of the world. Uh, I'll be happy to talk about that more, obviously. Another reason for 2025 as the target is that it's just starting to look as though actually that is the kind of target uh, that we need anyway. Uh, I say that, um, for example, because that's the conclusion that's been reached recently by the great um, um, ecological uh, economist, uh, Tim Jackson, who wrote Prosperity Without Growth. I'm just gonna put in the chat a reference to his recent paper in case you, are, you all haven't seen it, because it's really very, very revealing uh, it's called Zero Carbon Sooner. Um, what Tim argues uh, in that paper um, is that irregardless of considerations of precaution, simply on the basis uh, of, uh, of the science and on the basis of some kind of very basic um, premise of justice and equal shares, um, that for um, high emitting, uh, historically high emitting countries such as the UK, uh, you do the maths and it turns out that something like 2025 um, is actually where you need to be getting to zero, uh, to net zero carbon uh, by. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk about that more. Um, obviously, one aspect which is relevant uh, to that is uh, what matters, of course, really, um, is not what the, the final uh, target is. Uh, what matters, uh, uh, what, what the final date is. What matters is the total amount of emissions uh, under the curve 
of what we emit. So, you know, it'd be harmless if we had a 20, net zero 2050 target, so long as we did uh, an enormous amount of uh, a truly humongous amount of front loading, uh, as long as we did, you know, just absolutely incredibly vast uh, emissions reductions in the next three years, especially. Um, but if you're thinking about it in a more sort of slightly more uh, linear way, uh, then what Tim argues is that actually 2025 comes out uh, about right. Um, and I think that also it's obvious that having a date, I've already said, I've already mentioned the word prevarication, having a date which is um, not too far off, that can't be just kicked down the road in the way that governments kick down the road, typically anything which isn't within at the most a kind of medium term um, perspective. Um, the, 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 kind of agent, the kind of urgency that we need and the kind of agency that we need to mobilize suggests uh, a nearer uh, uh, date. Um, and remembering here that uh, Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, uh, said um, quite a while ago now um, that unless action begins within the next couple of years from when he said it, um, then there's no prospect of our reaching the kind of um, targets that the UN has set around, uh, around 2030. Um, and of course those targets are a lot less ambitious than the XR targets. So we need to start uh, now. Um, uh, that's, I think, really obvious to anybody with two brain cells to rub together. Now, thinking a tiny bit more about the 2025 target, um, the question which I'm sure is going to be on all of your minds is, well, can we do it? Um, let's first ask a slightly more complex question. Do, the, we, do we know that we can do it? And the answer to that question is very simple. No, we don't know that we can do it. But that's completely irrelevant in a wartime mobilization situation. You know, imagine um, Churchill going to scientists in 1940 and, and, and saying to them, can you prove that we can beat uh, Hitler within the next few uh, years, within the next five years, um, 1945? Um, imagine, you know, how unimpressed he would have been uh, by a reply, um, no, but we can prove that we can beat him by 1970. Uh, you know, that's completely uh, not of interest. Um, one has to try to, to do what one needs to try to do regardless of whether or not it turns out uh, that it actually is going to be uh, possible. Is it physically possible to go zero carbon by 2025? Well, obviously it's physically possible. It simply depends on what you're prepared to, uh, to change, what you're prepared to sacrifice. Um, and as has already been mentioned by Stuart, this crisis that we're undergoing right now shows that actually a lot of things that were thought to be impossible may be possible um, if the situation is understood to be uh, a real uh, emergency. Um, so, of course, it's physically possible. Uh, but the question which will be on many of your minds is, is it politically possible? And I guess what I'd like to say, the first thing I'd like to say in response to that is, well, um, leave that up to us. Um, that's what Extinction Rebellion is for, uh, to make what seems politically impossible possible. And we already achieved that to a significant extent in this country uh, last year, although obviously we've got a lot further uh, to go. Um, I would say to you, those of you on the call who are not involved uh, in anything like Extinction Rebellion, firstly, you know, uh, get involved, I'll come back to that. But if you don't want to get involved, um, well, all, carry on doing your, your job, which is obviously very, very important, um, uh, and uh, do it uh, to the, the best of your ability. Uh, and don't worry about um, whether or not uh, the policymakers, whoever, uh, who you're hoping to influence, um, are going to think that what you tell them uh, is something which is politically possible. Uh, leave that to us and make sure that you tell them uh, the truth about how you perceive the situation. And that is Extinction Rebellion's first demand, uh, tell the truth, which is a demand that we make first of all of government, but it's actually a demand that applies to all of us. It certainly applies to Extinction Rebellion ourselves, it certainly applies to philosophers, it certainly applies to scientists uh, and uh, technologists. Self-censorship in this field is extremely dangerous. It's something which has happened for a very long time. It's part of what has got us into the situation that we're in now of being in a true last chance saloon. Uh, I'll come back to that point. In terms of how to get there, in terms of how to get to the extremely ambitious targets that, uh, that we have in mind, um, well, uh, that's our third demand uh, in Extinction Rebellion. Uh, we say that there should be citizens' assemblies to decide how to get there. It's obvious, however, that to achieve 2025, to achieve 2025, there's no pure techno fix. Techno fixes alone are not going to enable us to achieve 2025. They might conceivably enable us to achieve 2050, but not 2025. 
significant chunks of our economy are going to have to be run down or phased out with a just transition if we're going to meet a target like that. That's a matter of, uh, of politics. Why would we contemplate that? Because the alternative is, is extreme uh, recklessness of another kind, of a much more drastic kind uh, involving uh, mass death. Uh, why wouldn't we contemplate doing something so drastic? Well, we wouldn't contemplate it if we were addicted to the status quo. If we're serious about end ending the utter recklessness of techno-industrial growth capitalism, we would contemplate, we will contemplate what needs to be done and we will act. And that comes to Extinction Rebellion's second demand, which is act now uh, with a view to um, going to carbon net zero and uh, biodiversity loss net zero by 2025. So, to bring this little bit of my uh, talk to a close, uh, many of you, I imagine, will be thinking on the one hand, um, gosh, what he's saying sounds a little bit extreme, but on the other hand, um, actually an awful lot of what he's saying sounds like it's probably plausible, true, or at least something we should be seriously worried about. Um, I'd like to say to you that in terms of your capacity to tell the truth uh, around uh, the challenges and what need to, needs to be done, uh, and so on, um, then it's really important if you try to do, I believe, the same kind of thing that I try to do, which is to make sure that you communicate uh, the urgency uh, and the uh, downsides of our not uh, achieving the kinds of uh, uh, drastic um, measures that I've been uh, sketching uh, so far. Um, if you communicate everything in a very sort of uh, matter of fact way, um, uh, as if this is just uh, another um, matter of policy alongside whatever, you know, uh, pensions provision or a consideration of, uh, of uh, uh, risk levels in certain um, hazardous chemicals that have been around a long time or something, um, then uh, people will get the message um, that actually this isn't that grave uh, a threat. Um, you need to find ways of communicating through your tone or through use of emotion or through uh, congruent actions going alongside what you say, um, that this is um, extremely serious. This is an existential uh, threat. Um, it's incongruent with this being an emergency um, to not do something like that. So one very good way, as I hinted earlier, of becoming congruent with the emergency uh, is to get involved in something that goes beyond uh, science and technology. Uh, an emergency changes the rules rather than involvement of that kind uh, signaling bias, non-involvement tacitly signals bias uh, against the, the message that this really is an emergency. It sends the covert message, actually things surely can't really be as bad as my report or whatever uh, suggests, because otherwise why wouldn't I be shouting about it? What does such involvement require? Well, you know, there's all sorts of different things you can do. You don't necessarily need to get uh, arrested. Um, the first thing, as I say, to do is to make sure that you don't um, hold back um, on uh, telling the truth about um, how dire you see the situation uh, as being. Okay, so um, a word now about how the coronavirus changes the situation um, to expand on what I've already said there and on what Stuart gestured at um, before. I believe that the coronavirus crisis represents uh, our last chance. Um, I think it's really as simple as that. Um, this kind of possibility for a societal reset on a global level um, does not occur very often. It doesn't even occur every decade. The last similar case was 2008, the financial crisis. Um, so, you know, there probably won't be another one along for at least five years, uh, maybe 10, maybe 15. Um, if we're talking about deadlines of 2025, 2030, that's clearly too late. This actually is our chance uh, right now. Uh, we have to seize it. Uh, and by comparison with 2008, there are, of course, various ways in which this crisis um, offers a, a real opportunity. Um, uh, there are um, things such as the, the fact that so many of us are enjoying not having planes going overhead, not enjoying not having so much uh, traffic uh, in our lives, enjoying being able to hear the birdsong more. Uh, air pollution is way down. Uh, a lot less people are dying of air pollution and of uh, road traffic uh, accidents. A lot of people are finding, actually, why do I uh, commute to work when I can actually work uh, from home? Um, moreover, um, in the horror of this, uh, of this crisis, this avoidable uh, tragedy, um, 
which uh, is itself a product of economic globalization, of the maltreatment of animals, of ecosystem uh, distraction, uh, and of rabid recklessness on the part of governments such as the US and UK uh, governments. Um, this, this crisis, which itself is, uh, is, um, is totemic of so many of the things that are wrong with our society as it currently uh, uh, exists. Uh, the way that this crisis manifests as a, as a planetary emergency uh, and as something which uh, manifests uh, our vulnerability and our potential mortality, um, it actually makes real a lot of the things that climate and ecological activists have been trying to bang on about for years, but which have been hard to make concrete because so often they're in the future. This is very much in the present uh, right now. So if it's possible to transfer some of the energy from the coronavirus uh, emergency to the climate and ecological emergency, if it's possible to resonate with that experience of, uh, of vulnerability, um, if it's possible to build on the fact that people are coming to have an understanding in this crisis of what's important, of what really matters in their lives, of how care uh, matters, of how GDP perhaps isn't actually uh, as important as whether or not my uh, father or grandfather is about to uh, get killed. Um, and it's very striking that opinion polls are showing an overwhelming majority of people in this country saying saving lives in this crisis is more important uh, than GDP, GDP growth. Not that of course there's any actual opposition between the economy uh, and taking sensible action on the uh, virus. Uh, as is extremely clear if you look at the experience of a country like Taiwan or New Zealand, because they acted sensibly uh, and early, because they weren't uh, reckless, they've been able to preserve their economies as well as the health uh, of their people. But even if there were a genuine opposition uh, between the two, uh, the British people are saying, uh, we don't want you to kill our parents so that we can uh, hurry back to uh, economic business as usual. And all of these are enormously hopeful signs uh, gifts coming out of this horrendous crisis that we're in right now. If these cannot be the basis for a reset that actually works for people and for planet, then I think within the time frame that we have, it's not realistic to think that anything can. So we have to do it now. Um, Antonio Gutierrez's uh, timetable has just become uh, more important, more relevant than ever. Um, whether there is a future for humanity or not is, is very likely to depend upon what happens in 2020 and 2021. So uh, no pressure. Okay, before I draw my remarks to a close, I'm gonna to attempt to make uh, a few more specific remarks relevant to carbon capture and storage, which obviously is an area that uh, a number of you, a large number of you are uh, interested in. I should stress that I'm not an expert in this area, um, although I know, um, um, good friends and colleagues who are, and I've been consulting with them prior to this little talk uh, that I'm giving. So um, a few remarks about uh, that angle of, of where we're at. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the bold pitch that I've made for, for bold uh, action, where does CCS fit in? Um, and, you know, I'm going to level with you. I'm going to be uh, uh, um, truthful uh, and uh, provocative. Um, I'm not sure it fits in terribly much, to be honest. Um, I have a number of uh, concerns. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that Bex is an ecological catastrophe uh, and should be stopped. Um, I'm concerned about um, uh, EOR uh, and the way in which uh, CCS is, uh, has too often been closely associated uh, with EOR. Um, I'm concerned about the moral hazard. Um, CCS can in effect allow non-CCS um, energy generation to go ahead on a wing and a prayer for the foreseeable future. That's an extremely dangerous situation to be in. Uh, as far as I can tell, the best case for CCS uh, is in quite specific areas, such as um, cement uh, and perhaps uh, steel production, uh, not uh, in energy generation. Um, in terms of cement and concrete and so forth, what I would say is, well, look, um, we're gonna have to make do on with a lot less of those uh, in the future anyway. We're gonna have to be looking for alternatives. Uh, if we binge on uh, construction in the next five to ten years, it's completely impossible to think about uh, reaching um, tough uh, carbon reduction targets uh, this decade. Uh, as Stuart said at the start, um, we look like we're going to have a significant drop in carbon emissions uh, this year. 
we have to do the same thing every year for, for until we reach uh, carbon uh, zero. Um, is that really compatible with um, trying to sort of bolt something on basically to uh, business as usual? We need to be thinking seriously, I would argue, about um, energy descent uh, instead. Um, turning to my uh, title um, uh, for this uh, talk, um, we've got in a situation right now where the oil price is very low, where uh, oil reserves are around the world, in many cases are virtually full. Now is the time, I would suggest, for us to be thinking about shutting down uh, some oil wells, uh, not um, um, thinking that we can have a technology soon or not so soon, which is going to enable them to carry on uh, working. Um, uh, and again, that question of timing uh, is very pertinent uh, here. Um, uh, if we are going to have really ambitious um, carbon emissions reduction targets, um, if we are looking at dates like 2030 or 2025, uh, then it just isn't good enough to, uh, to punt on a potential future-oriented uh, uh, techno fix. We ought to be going for the sure bets uh, instead. The renewables that are already here, genuine renewables like uh, solar and wind, of course. Um, we ought to be thinking about uh, how to have uh, storage solutions to overcome the intermittency problem, which don't depend upon high ongoing baseload, but uh, rather are looking at, uh, at diverse uh, storage solutions. I think not mainly battery-based solutions. Um, Gravity-based solutions, for example, seem to me a, a lot more promising there. And you know, some of you are obviously going to have great um, engineering um, uh, skills and so on, which you know I have zero of. Um, you know, those can be put to to bear just as much in, in gravity-based uh, solutions to to storage for energy, for example, uh, as they can for uh, for CCS. Um, so I think that. Um, the, the title of this talk was posed as a question. Uh, are we going to see um, the demise of uh, oil uh, and the ends of, uh, uh, of high-end uh, conspicuous consumption? Um, uh, uh, are we going to see the end of, uh, of uh, political liberalism, the ideology which has ruled us for so long, uh, the hegemony of liberty and freedom um, in a certain economistic version of those, which has got us into the trouble that we're in? Um, well, it's a question. Uh, the answer depends upon uh, what we do. The answer depends upon what reset, how we reset uh, right now. What is clear, I think, is that we need to think as a society uh, and as a collective uh, and not to um, put forward uh, values, uh, ideas, uh, ways of imagining the future, which encourage people to continue to fantasize that they can continue to live uh, as uh, separate individuals um, uh, getting their meaning from um, consuming. consuming. Uh, and the wonderful thing about the coronavirus crisis is that, again, it has shown us the importance, the necessity, and the possibility of thinking better as a society and as a community uh, through things like the mutual aid networks that have sprung up, through things like the NHS clap, uh, in the way that we understand now that we, that we can't have a healthy society if some part of that society is unhealthy. We can't have a healthy world if you've got reservoirs of infection waiting to to reinfect uh, elsewhere um, uh, in the world. Um, the coronavirus has taught us exactly the things that we need in order to have the possibility of transforming our society so radically that we may not need to be uh, burning so much uh, oil and gas and coal quite soon. Uh, and if that's the case, then we may not need um, nearly so much CCS as it has been assumed uh, that we would need. So that's my thought provocation. Uh, it's half past three. I think I will uh, stop there, uh, uh, hand it over to back to you guys. I'd love to hear your, your questions and comments. Uh, I will also add one or two more uh, references to support one or two of the things I've said uh, in the chat in the next few minutes. Okay. Great. So thank you very much indeed, Rupert. That was um, pretty clear to me anyway. Hopefully it's uh, clear to everybody else as well. That's a very uh, firm and well constructed position uh whether or not you share the foundations of and worldview i guess will come out of this, a few questions so obviously i'm going to uh, ask people to volunteer questions or comment uh we've got 61 participants on at the moment so that's to me a record for this uh friday afternoon event so that's useful could i say something possibly 
Always. Right, Herbert, you got, you're always keen to say something. I, so I, I, yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm, up, I'm only going to speak if you're happy about that. I'm very happy as long as it's a short question, yes. Uh, uh, well, it's more a statement than a question. Could I say that uh, thinking about the first part of your talk, the need to uh, consider very carefully what we're doing to the atmosphere. I think everybody who's listening agrees totally with that. Mm -hmm. But I'm afraid the point I'm going to make is, and I'll give you zillions, in that, that's unfair, give you a lot of examples. Extinction Rebellion is going absolutely the wrong way to do that. Let me just tell you a little story, because I like telling little stories, uh, because I think they're indicative. A long time ago, when there were still telegrams and things, there was an old man who was rather blind, uh, and he had a son who was not a very nice guy. And the son went away at one stage and then had some difficulties and needed some money. So he sent a telegram to his father. Of course, his father couldn't read it, and so the man who delivered the telegram would open it and read it. And he said, he was a bit of a crusty old man, he said, Father, send money. And the father said, I'm not sending money. I'm not giving you any money. You're not very good. Two, three days later, same telegram, father, send money. I'm not doing that. To cut it short, the last time a young guy was the telegram director. He opened the telegram, exactly the same telegram, and, it said, and he read it, father, send money. And ah, he's going to talk like that. I'll send him money. I hate to say it, and I'll give you lots of example. Extinction Rebellion does, Father, send money! And maybe the worst that I'll tell you, or I could tell you, is that it, they had a, a big uh, stopping of all traffic in Cambridge. I come from Cambridge. Terrific. It took uh, 40, 50 policemen uh, doing their work to see that all was well. They stopped traffic on the way to Addenbrooke's hospital. I've heard from some of my friends who are medics that a number of people died because medics were late getting there. No one's going to quite say that. And I could give you other examples. Extinction Rebellion is going about it in totally the wrong way. Um, so, Professor uh, Herbert, so, uh, sorry, Professor Herbert, um, I asked Rupert whether I could join in here. I think, um, so I'm, I'm a, a younger member of Extinction Rebellion and um, I, I've heard those sorts of comments quite a lot and I don't, um, I don't deny that what you've heard is, is probably true. However, um, as we've seen with many things, I think the press likes to sensationalize quite a lot. And so we hear a lot of these stories and we see a lot of the pictures of, of bridges, and I know myself, I've been sat on Waterloo Bridge, which is right by St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, I've also been part of a blockade in Swansea where blood bikes were trying to get through. Um, and in Swansea, we moved so that the blood bikes got through. Um, and I know that they're, what, what the press doesn't like to, um, uh, what the press doesn't like to talk about and what I certainly didn't see at the start but the longer that I've been a member the more that I've seen is all of the backroom conversations um, and there are a lot of backroom conversations and, and um, Rupert will be part of that uh, at, at a much greater level than me um, but there are a lot of backroom well, Jennifer, could you make your, Not only could you have a question or a comment? Because I'd like to focus on the philosophy rather yeah, than... Yeah, fair, the, fair the, enough. The, but the, the, there's a lot of stuff goes on with XR that we don't see. And Miles Allen, who was on here a while ago, has thanked Extinction Rebellion because it's opened backroom doors for him as well. Yeah, if I could just uh, add to what Jennifer said, that's absolutely right. And I, I get that uh, feedback all the time. I get business leaders, politicians, et cetera, constantly uh, say to me, usually in private, they don't want to say it in public, um, keep doing what you're doing because you're making change possible. Um, I think that what's true is that Extinction Rebellion uh, has, has done things in a way which doesn't mean that it, Extinction Rebellion, will itself necessarily become popular, but that's not the point. We're not trying to make ourselves popular. We're trying to uh, create, force a conversation uh, and uh, create um, actual change in public opinion, which makes possible um, uh, a real political change. 
And that's happened. It's clear that, that public opinion was significantly influenced. You can look at the opinion polls which show this uh, last year in this country, especially I'm, around our April rebellion. I'm going to agree with that as well, because uh, I was asked to go on Talk Radio London or whatever it's called, LBC, up against Nick Ferrari, who's you know a well-known uh, non-lefty. And to, it was clear that it was going to try and uh, tell me that the whole thing was wrong. So I just basically looked up the Google hits on climate and environment and Extinction Rebellion. And since the Extinction Rebellion start, action started off, the hits on Extinction Rebellion barely moved, but the hits on climate and environment were, as we now know, exponential. We now know the meaning of exponential quite well. So it had a really tangible effect. And it's changed what people might call the Overton window, the permission to discuss. And so by producing a radical uh, position, that pulls the discussion further away from the other extreme. Yeah, I've just added another uh, poll showing this in the, in the chat. Okay, next so question. We have another question or comment. Um, can, I, can I ask a question, please? Like Jim's up. Oh, yeah. Yep, go ahead, Jim. You say who you are or anything? Hi, uh, my name is Abdul Aziz Aliu. Um, thanks, Rupert, for the very interesting um, talk. My questions are one, you appear not to be um, favorable to carbon capture and storage for the energy industry. Um, the idea is not to continue with carbon capture forever um, for the energy industry. Um, we cannot pull the plugs of fossil fuel electricity generation at the moment. Um, we cannot convert to renewable and green energy tomorrow. So what CCS does is more or less like a transitional technology that will fill in the gap between fossil fuel intensive economy to a renewable or um, green economy. My second question is... Well, you... may, may I take that, that question? Yeah. Because there, there's already quite a lot there. Um, so obviously I've heard that argument uh, before. Um, I confess I don't find it very convincing at all. Um, here's the reason. You say it's going to be transitional, but as Mark Jacobson and others have shown, I'm just putting the link in the, in the chat again, um, the, there are massive um, uh, upfront uh, costs for uh, choosing to go down one route or, or another and path dependencies that you get which means that if you go down that route, you're going to be going down it, not just for you know, a few years, you're going to be going down it for five, for, not five, for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. Those are years that we don't have. The other point about time um, is that uh, CCS uh, is not um, uh, you know, available in any serious uh, scale now. And that's what we need, stuff that is available now. Now you re may reply to me there saying, Oh yeah, but um, uh, we can't uh, just power everything by renewables now. Uh, we can't just come off uh, fossil fuels now. But my reply to that is, well, we need to do so over the next uh, five years or so in a country like the UK, in the next 10 years or so globally. And that I think is something we can do. And one reason we know we can do it is because we've seen in the past couple of months, the incredible vast changes, including enormous reductions in fossil fuel use, which is why the cost of uh, oil has plummeted and at one point was even negative. Um, we've seen that you actually can do it. So, you know, th these lines of we, we can't make drastic changes quickly are just not plausible uh, anymore. Uh, and that seems to me to really undermine the case for CCS as a so-called uh, intermediate step. And as I say, uh, it seems to me that the that CCS should be thought of being thought of at most much more restrictively now uh, in really difficult areas such as such as uh, cement. I'm not saying uh, that I'm in favour of CCS for cement production. I'm saying it, it deserves to be very very seriously looked at there. But I think that uh, on on energy generation, it's looking like it's yesterday's technology. 
Thank you very much for your answer. Um, I rest my second question with, with, with regards to your first answer. Thank you very much. Could I ask a question, please? Yep, who's that? Um, hi, it's Louise Handy. I'll put my video on. Um, thank you uh, for, your, for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, you obviously have your reservations about CCS. Um, and of course, we need to move to renewable energies. What do we do about the carbon dioxide in the air now that is excess? Mm. Yeah. How, what, what, what do you propose for that? Because the way I see it is carbon capture is, and, and BEX, in fact, are, are two of the best technologies to remove that carbon dioxide. Yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And of course, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the ideal answer would be something like, well, if I, were, if I were setting out to go to that nice place, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, you know, we, we're in, a, a, we're in a, a, a dire situation, which is why we have to uh, be prepared to consider uh, possibilities which are less than ideal. But, um, but I'd say two things. Firstly, I'd say um, in terms of what I would positively propose as alternatives, uh, the, most, uh, the, the most crucial uh, and basic thing that we should be doing is we should be looking for uh, natural, so-called natural carbon solutions, um, which are uh, not uh, based on you know, gigantic monocultures, et cetera, in the way that most uh, BEX is, but they're instead based in, um, uh, in um, reconstructing uh, and allowing to be recreated uh, genuine biodiverse uh, ecosystems, returning forests to places where there were forests and bringing back mangrove swamps and so on and so forth. Um, the second thing I would say is going back to something I said uh, uh, in my talk, um, we do need to be really quite concerned, it seems to me, um, that um, CCS and CDR uh, type uh, technologies um, expose us to a grave danger of moral hazard. There'll be uh, an argument that people will use. They'll say, look, there's too much carbon in the atmosphere. We have to find effective ways of getting it out. So we should have BEX or, or CDR. But in practice, what is quite likely to happen, it seems to me, uh, is that that will be taken uh, as a license to uh, carry on uh, burning fossil fuel uh, at the very time, i.e. now, when we can least afford to do so. And, and I do see the, I do see, see your point, but I think that's up to us, the CCS community, to, to communicate to the wider public that CCS isn't something we want to have to do. It's not pretty, it's not elegant, it's, it's necessary. It's cleaning up rubbish. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not something we, we want to do to enable business as usual approach. Yeah, and of course, you know, if you're in uh, CCS and you're going to stay in it, then, then as you say, yeah, that's your responsibility and that's a possible, you know, a responsible thing that you can do. Um, but um, it won't be fully in your control, uh, to put it mildly, right? Um, the, the part of the, the, the danger of, uh, of, uh, of CCS, like the danger more, more generally of, of geoengineering, um, is that this is starting to enter wide public consciousness and the, the policy arsenals of policy makers, uh, etc. Um, that we, we can't afford at this moment, uh, in my view, to give ourselves any further excuse for delay. We ought to be finding natural ways of drawing down uh, carbon dioxide. But first and foremost, we've got to turn off the tap. We've got to stop the spigot running and anything which is going to get in the way of, uh, of a, a very sharp reduction of fossil fuel use is really problematic. Can I Thank you for the question. Before? So we, we were fortunate enough to have uh, Professor Miles Allen um, speak a, a few weeks ago um, and he was talking about uh, carbon capture because I, I, I typed in the comments to Louise, I bet he's going to say rewilding because that is your thing. Um, and what Professor Allen was saying was that, that the rewilding needs to happen, but the only thing that it will, will achieve is soaking up all of the emissions from farming that we do in the next few years. And also rewilding is a very long term solution and it can take hundreds of years for trees to soak up enough. So. Um, whilst I agree with the precautionary principle that we can't see carbon capture as, as a be all and end, as, as a silver bullet, we, I think we, 
he was saying that we still desperately need it um, to deal with, with the emissions right now and, and getting us down to net zero. And he came up with the idea that we get the fossil fuel companies to pay for it and they have to decrease though they have to capture 10 percent of what they emit year on year and that brings them back down okay thanks jennifer so let, let me make two points of response to to that um the the first point is um that i think that argument only works if as miles does you have a more distant uh, target date in mind for a carbon uh, net zero I don't think it works if your date uh, carbon net zero is 2025 or 2030. Um, the, the second point, uh, what is the second point? Um, actually, I've forgotten the second point. I'll, ask you <laughs> It'll come back I'll, to I'll ask David, I'll ask David Reiner to ask the question which you've put in the text in the chat, anticipating the answer of citizens assemblies and uh, rebutting it. Yeah, so no, I, I mean, I knew the answer, you know, the short answer <laughs> is citizens assemblies. Um, but I, I just, I, I don't find that compelling enough unless what you're envisioning is something, you know, on the order of the Soviets or something and <laughs> kind of post um, uh, revolutionary Russia. I mean, the, 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 you know, to be truly democratic, you would need to have not just sort of this token citizens assembly uh, that, that, that's going on at, at the moment, uh, but you would need kind of a mass rollout of these Mm -hmm. citizens assemblies right and that's right and and given that you know i mean again those of us in this chat room are largely uh, of a certain persuasion um you know the british public you know in its entirety is not right there are significant you know not large but there are numbers of climate deniers there are a number of kind of more right-wing populists who you know, who are, you know, I think Nicola Sturgeon was talking about, I don't know if it's got it going ahead, but, you know, those who are opposed to the, the, the lockdown for, for something that's seemingly more uh, directly uh, uh, threatening to people's health, um, like, like the, the current COVID crisis. So, so yeah. I guess the question is, what, what do you imagine would, uh, you know, would allow for legitimacy, you know, or the perceived legitimacy of these of these citizens assemblies um, that wouldn't yeah. kind of engender kind of some, you know, reaction from the, from the other side. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think I really like the way you put that question, uh, David. Uh, and um, uh, what I would say in answer is you're absolutely right. Um, citizens assemblies aren't going to be any good at the end of the day in, in terms of actually achieving our goals if they're constituted like the UK citizen assembly we have right, right now. So just in case anyone on the call doesn't know, there is a citizen assembly that was created last uh, last year by Parliament. Uh, again, you know, um, in response to um, Extinction Rebellion, clearly, basically power has has given a sort of pseudo uh, acceptance for all three of our demands. We demanded they tell the truth. They declared a climate and environment emergency, but it was only symbolic. We demanded a carbon net zero target. They said, OK, but it'll be 2050. Uh, and we demanded a citizens assembly and they said you can have one but it won't have any power it'll be a talking shop even that can be of some use in terms of changing the atmosphere uh, uh in the country um uh and but yeah what we actually need are citizens assemblies that are uh, empowered um uh and the uh, the one in france is a bit more like that but it's still uh it's still not uh, uh going all the way we would like to see citizens assemblies that were, for, for example, had the power if they had a sufficiently high um, uh, majority, a sort of super majority within the Citizens Assembly, that, that, that what they recommended would simply become law. Um, and I think at some point, smart politicians may realize, and I think Macron has almost realized this in France, that this could be to their advantage. Because when there are difficult political issues, and this of course is why the Citizens Assembly was used and worked in, uh, in Ireland, to, uh, to tackle the, uh, the, the gay rights and abortion issues, which had been so divisive and so seemingly impossible there. When there are difficult issues that politicians are finding it really difficult to, to lead on, if they outsource those, the more fully they outsource those to be decided by citizens' uh, assemblies, um, the more um, their own hands will not be um, caught up in the matter. They can say, look, it's not, it's not me who's insisting that whatever, that Heathrow gets shut down or something, right? The you, the citizens decided this. 
a group of you were randomly selected to represent everybody. You had the best of information. Uh, you had the chance to deliberate at length, etc. And just like a jury, you know, you decided that the right thing to do was such and such. Um, that's the way that it could work. So yeah, we need citizens assemblies empowered at every level uh, and they need to be empowered. And that is the way that they could actually work and be perceived to be legitimate uh, and democratic uh, and actually change uh, um, the, uh, the political and legislative situation uh, in a country like this one. But I just worry that the clock speed of the sort of democratic reforms that you're talking about are, you know, blow way through 2025, right? And it's been obvious that, you know, the UK needs some sort of, you know, constitutional convention for as long as I've been here, which is 2003. <laughs> uh, that, you know, the, the UK is a dysfunctional, you know, entity. Uh, there are lots of reasons for thinking about political reform. I just wonder whether, you know, that actually is compatible with this kind of urgency of the climate time scale. Well, right? yeah. So look, I think it, it has to be a citizen's assembly which is premised on the understanding that this is an emergency. Uh, and the, the, the possibility we have for that now, um, uh, right now, uh, is in relation to the coronavirus crisis. One obvious way of kind of deciding how to reset, which is gonna be you know, very difficult and messy and so on, uh, is through a citizen's assembly which would take maybe the, the next three months or something to, to, to meet and decide a load of stuff. And it could be tasked with, uh, with resetting in a way that didn't just throw us from the frying pan of coronavirus into the fire of, uh, of climate breakdown. Yeah, because, you know, I mentioned earlier some of the fantastic possibilities uh, that there are coming out of this horrendous crisis. There are also, of course, the difficulties and downsides. Um, so, for example, public transport is facing difficulties now with physical distancing. Uh, you've got like th this, m this kind of growing mountain of uh, used PPE that needs to be disposed of. Is that going to be a sort of uh, endless sort of environmental um, uh, albatross around our, around our necks? Um, uh, so what we have to do is find an effective way of thinking about how to be in this crisis and how to emerge from it in a way which is not um, environmentally, uh, climatically, etc., destructive. I think that uh, citizens could be involved in that. So I'm going to pause, stop there and move on to a different type of question. So Paolo asked the question, can Paolo ask his question? I'm interested in the numbers really, because we're very obsessed with the UK as a small island off the shore of the continent. But actually China on its own can sink the entire world if it uh, carries on the way it is. So I'd like uh, some commentary from uh, Paolo and then from Martin Lord if he wants to chip in. So I'm just looking at the chat lines. So Paolo, could you ask your question? Yeah, that no, was very simple. How are we going to stop in a peaceful way the coal power station in China? They are brand new, some of those. Are they going to pollute for the next 30, 40 years? I mean, this guy is not going to listen to, to some nice talk. You're saying a lot of things that are perfectly right, and I agree with a lot of, a lot of you're saying, but there are concrete problems. So, I don't know what, what do you think about this. Yeah. Um... So, you know, that's, uh, that's the elephant in the room, isn't it? Um, it's very important for us to remember, though, yes, that, the, the big that actually a lot of the elephant is us, um, right? A lot, a lot of those uh, Chinese coal-fired power stations are burning to produce products for British people and European people and North American uh, people. So it's, it's all the first thing we always have to say whenever China enters into the conversation is, actually, let's take some bloody responsibility, right? Um, China only looks like such a huge problem because we, ha we have stupid, untruthful ways of calculating uh, emissions. We need to get much more serious about uh, embedded uh, emissions. They need to be included uh, in the figures. And then the government couldn't get away anymore with the, the absurd statistical lie that we've reduced our emissions by uh, 40% uh, in the past uh, generation. You know, simply false once you include the embedded uh, emissions. But of course, um, there's also, uh, un there's also China wanting to develop uh, uh, and uh, have its own uh, industrial revolution and growth and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's a, that's a vast uh, problem. Um, it's a problem that there's only so much that we can uh, do about um, once we've uh, taken um, um, responsibility for our own part of the, the problem, which is a lot. Um, 
how can we lead uh, on this? How can we influence China? Well, one thing to bear in mind is that China has also said that it wants to build an ecological uh, civilization. And there are people in China who are extremely aware of the, um, extent, the extent to which they're on the front line of ecological and climatic um, uh, disaster themselves. Um, uh, so that provides one potential uh, opening. Another is that it is actually absolutely vital for us to uh, lead um, because we have absolutely zero credibility saying to countries like China and India, look, you really should reduce your uh, climate deadly emissions when we're, um, we've got such a huge historical responsibility and such an ongoing high uh, uh, consumption. Um, so um, the only possible way in which we get to be in a position, if you will, to answer your question adequately, Paolo, is if we start to do the kind of thing that I'm talking about. If we start to say, look, actually, we're not all we've been cracked up to be. Uh, we're living in a completely unsustainable way. We're gonna change our ways. We're gonna massively uh, reduce uh, uh, consumption. We're gonna, we're gonna slash fossil fuel use and begin that rapid energy descent without which um, uh, eco-driven societal collapse uh, is coming. Uh, and then maybe if we do that, if we do it in such a way that we uh, are able to show that we can uh, continue to, to have and in fact in some ways have better uh, lives than we've had before, um, well then maybe they'll take some notice. So Martin Lord, do you want to put another spin on that slightly? Uh, yeah, well I, I, think, I think you're right about handling embedded emissions. I think that's probably the uh, the most likely way to get to where we need to go without um, causing something really nasty. Uh, about China, I'm actually uh, more optimistic. Uh, they have built lots of coal, but uh, that's actually been against what the central government has told the local governments to do. Uh, so essentially... Clock. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh. They've essentially um, uh, built uh, in the regions um, basically to support jobs um, and they're running at something like 30%. So they, they never needed to build them in the first place. They're, they're simply being built to, uh, to provide jobs to build them. And how do you then see the, because I agree that China, we project onto China lots of our own and fears of our own way of operating and I'm not sure that China does have that way of operating in terms of an American global domination uh, superpower that's a slightly different conversation but what does seem to be apparent is that the Chinese state knows fine that they've got huge air pollution problems yeah and huge uh, mimics of the United States commute to work road-based civilization but yet they still proceed so, Winning yeah, the but that may, they may, it's, we don't know, you know, how the coronavirus thing is going to play out. Um, what is uh, clear is that there are a number of people in China who uh, have noticed <laughs> some of the ways in which, uh, uh, in which um, uh, the, the changes that were made uh, in emergency response earlier this year have had collateral improvements. You know, people in some cities in China have literally been able to see the sky for the first time ever. I mean, it sounds bizarre to us, but you know, the air pollution situation in parts of China is worse than it is by far anywhere uh, in this country. Um, and when you can literally see the, see the sky and when your lungs are not literally you know, hurting when you go outside, um, well, that can make quite a powerful impact upon you. So who knows that there, there may be possibilities there that could play out uh, uh, positively and we need them to, as I say. I believe that uh, the situation that we're in with this, uh, with this crisis, this coronavirus crisis, is pretty much certainly our last chance to get things right on the climate crisis. So I'm going to ask you a question from me a little bit to try and bring it back to the UK a little bit. So we, saw, we heard a lot from Extinction Rebellion last year, calendar year 2019, but right now I'm starting to get deluged in my mailbox with all sorts of master plans for how to do a green recovery from the virus. Yeah. But yet I'm not hearing much. So this is from Extinction Rebellion. Uh, this is a time of flux, potentially an opportunity, never waste a good crisis. So what would, uh, 
how are Extinction Rebellion going to, you asked us to leave the politics to you, how are Extinction Rebellion going to do the politics and influence the Boris and his acolytes? Yeah, um, so um, the answer to that in the Extinction Rebellion terms is somewhat indirect. Um, it is um, to do essentially with citizens' assemblies. In other words, at the centre of what we are, are going to say is, we're not going to tell you what the answer is. Uh, we want that question to be thrown open uh, to the people. And we think that's the only way uh, that you're going to get um, the kind of buy-in for transformative change, for a system change that we so desperately need. Um, we're not going to quite leave it at that. We're going to make some suggestions. Um, we're, we, we're working right now, for example, with the city of Amsterdam, uh, who are uh, trying to lead quite boldly uh, in terms of a, a genuinely green post-corona uh, uh, reset. Um, we're going to be coming out with one or two um, op-eds uh, soon. Uh, we're going to make some suggestions for the kind of direction we think things should go in. What we're not going to do is come up with one of these kind of full blueprints that in any case, as you say, other people uh, are coming up with. Um, I will make one specific remark, which uh, is to some extent an, an XR remark and to some extent just me uh, speaking, which is that something which is quite worrying uh, about the way this is being talked about when people talk about a green recovery is that the way that quite a lot, by no means all, uh, but what quite a lot of, uh, of people seem to imply by that is a return to economic growth, uh, so-called green growth, uh, etc. If that's the route we go down, then I think it's almost certain that we will, will, we will be squandering uh, this, uh, this last chance. We need to reset in a way which doesn't get us back onto the same old uh, uh, growthist uh, treadmill. Uh, and if you fantasize that with renewable energy or, or CCS, uh, you can have um, uh, endless uh, uh, economic growth, which is genuinely green. Well, it is a fantasy. And I think that the work of uh, Peter Victor and Tim Jackson and others uh, shows that very clearly. I'm just also going to put in the chat my own sort of personal response to the corona crisis um, in terms of the question that's just been asked in case anyone wants to see it. It's a Medium article. You're good at multitasking, I have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I've done quite a few of these now. I've suddenly got used to doing this over the last six, uh, six, eight weeks since lockdown started. Yeah, speaking and typing at the same time is quite hard. Okay. Uh, anybody else got a question? I mean, I can, I, Tim yeah. Dixon has something. Is he? All right. Oh, yeah. So, yes. Tim, go ahead, please. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Rupert, for that. And, and thanks, Stuart. Um, just uh, a, a general thanks, I think, uh, listening to the discussion that we've had. I mean, Extinction Rebellion has been very successful in getting the conversation into the public about climate change. And I think you've done a great job uh, with that. And, and that Thanks. goes across the sort of the spectrum. Uh, I have one sort of request though, and that's just to try and be more technology neutral. Um, I think, you know, undermines the uh, message on urgency to then say, we, have, but we only want these technologies and not those technologies. I think we need to apply everything that works. We don't really have the luxury mm. of being able to pick and choose our favourite technologies. Um, and then just the last thing I'd like to say is another thank you, because uh, unwittingly you, you did help CCS a little bit. Um, <clears throat> which you probably don't know this, but um, uh, it, it's a short story, Stuart, if I'm allowed a short story. <laughs> And it's to do with the London Convention, which is the big international treaty, Rupert, that protects the marine environment from all sorts of pollution. And they had a big CCS issue to resolve last October, and they were being hosted at the IMO in London. And the CCS ex issue was about export of CO2 from countries who don't want to store it or can't store it to countries who can store it, like Norway locally. Um, so it was a big deal for CCS coming up. And the London Convention concerns all pollutants, but they are very concerned about the CO2 impacts on the ocean because of ocean acidification. Yeah, yes. yes. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm engaged in that. And it was their meeting, their annual meeting, so 90 countries in a UN setup on the IMO on the banks of the River Thames next to Lambeth Bridge at the beginning of October, which is when Extinction Rebellion was having its direct action. Yes. So we were able to have our coffees in the IMO looking out and spectating the, the events outside. So I turn this to, to our advantage and in my plenary talk, 
I made reference not just to the latest technical developments on CCS and monitoring and things, but also the needs, the evidence from the IPCC on the need for CCS from the IEA. And I concluded with, um, in terms of climate change, you can see that the citizens of the UK are also demanding further action on climate change, uh, as you witness every coffee break. And <laughs> that, that had a resonance because they could indeed see that every meeting. So I did yeah, make yeah. reference to your actions and um, I did expect it to get reported in the plenary report actually, because I wrote it down afterwards for the translators to use, or in advance for the translators to use, but they didn't actually include that part in the report of the meeting. But nonetheless, yes. I thought I'd mention that, that, that I was able to use that, your that, uh, actions. Uh, yeah. in the context, uh, I, I, and, and it was a successful result for CCS at the end of that as well. Well, good. Uh, uh, I've heard lots of stories like that. That's a nice, powerful, concrete one, which I will, which I will log. Uh, the point about a build-up of marine CO2 levels, of course, very, very important one, shows the crucialness of finding some successful ways of ongoing uh, drawdown uh, methods, although we might differ on what exactly uh, those ideally uh, should be. Um, you know, people sometimes say, um, um, if we uh, get to carbon uh, net zero, then we'll essentially uh, have, uh, have solved, the, uh, solved the problem. But that isn't true, of course, because um, there, will will, there will still be, um, even if we do get to a point there where the, where the amount of carbon in the atmosphere isn't increasing, um, there will still very likely be uh, an increasing uh, amount of, uh, of uh, carbon in the ocean. Uh, mm. In other words, it'll be partly not increasing because uh, of ongoing uh, ocean acidification, which is a, a terrifying uh, prospect. And we all have to be very conscious of that and make sure we do stuff uh, against it. Um, on the point about being technology neutral, I should perhaps have been a bit clearer in my, in my talk. I was trying to be very concise. When I was making those remarks that were uh, uh, um, critical of, of CCS, I was really speaking for myself. I wasn't speaking for Extinction Rebellion. That was just a kind of attempt on my part to uh, enter into the conversation with you guys on this uh, specific call. Uh, and Jennifer's made an interesting remark that's relevant to that in the, uh, in the chat. You know, uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, as I've sought to uh, indicate, has actually very quite few uh, concrete uh, demands uh, and limits, but Extinction Rebellion places most things in the hands or wants to place most things in the hands of citizens' assemblies. Uh, finally, in terms, of, in terms of sort of developing that thought about technology neutrality a little bit further, um, something which clearly uh, could and should work for CCS and or uh, renewables and or energy efficiency, etc., is some kind of um, economic um, solution along the lines of a carbon tax or carbon rationing. You know, I'm very concerned about the regressive effects potentially of a, of a carbon tax. Um, so I hope that, uh, that your community are, um, among other things, uh, arguing strongly for a, a strong um, uh, economic, uh, really, really serious uh, economic uh, levers, which will clear the space for, uh, maybe it's a different technology, maybe it's a, a different um, uh, you know, social uh, solution. Uh, there, are, there are different ways, as you imply in your question, um, uh, uh, in which we might uh, be able to meet the, uh, the targets that we also desperately want to meet. In terms of technology neutrality or technology options, I'm going to call Laura Finney from the UK Research and Innovation, because I think many people on the call will be agnostic about nature-based solutions, but would also say they're potentially not fast enough and we've got a vast excess of CO2 in the air. So what about more uh, technological methods? So Laura, do you want to ask? A question. Yeah, so I guess I caveat this with, I don't think I have formed my opinion on it. Um, but I wanted to see what your thoughts were. So some of the things that we hear in the community, I guess, are that net zero is all well and good, but we already have uh, pumped a lot of CO2 out into the atmosphere. And is net zero far enough? So I wondered if Extinction Rebellion had a, a stance on net negative and how? And if so, how how do you think we could realistically do that? Yeah. So Extinction Rebellion has uh, no stance uh, on that. Um, the Extinction Rebellion uh, target is for net zero by such and such a date. Basically, what it, what it boils down to is is 2025 in countries like this, and 2030 
uh, uh, elsewhere um, in the world. Although you know that's an oversimplification, but it's pretty, that's basically um, uh, it. Uh, there's also quite a number of us uh, in Extinction Rebellion who are concerned about some of the potential for abuse in a, a net zero target as opposed to a real zero uh, uh, target. Um, my own view is that that isn't so much of a worry um, given the kind of timescales we're talking about. In other words, um, if you're talking about uh, net zero 2050, let alone 2070 or something, you know, you can just put, you can just punt on non-existent technologies to do the net part for you. But if you're talking about 2025 or 2030, then most of it, uh, and to increasingly to an increasingly large extent, nearly all of it will have to be real zero uh, rather than uh, net zero. Um, what I think it would be safe to say, um, Extinction Rebellion uh, uh, would be uh, behind um, uh, is the endeavor to use um, um, good uh, natural climate solutions as opposed to, you know, crap, fake uh, biofuel, etc. natural climate solutions. Good natural climate uh, solutions, not um, as an excuse for carrying on burning fossil fuels. Uh, but as a way of drawing down some of that excess CO2, right? And I think it's quite useful sometimes to uh, make that kind of um, a distinction. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, Rupert, then, if we draw down carbon from the atmosphere into peatlands or into forestry or even into yeah. soil carbon, that's got a lifetime in those biomass sectors of tens of years. Whereas it's quite clear from the climate modelling that you need to take that CO2, that carbon out of the biosphere for thousands or even 10,000 years. So there are orders of magnitude still of mismatch between the science bit and the, the near term action. So the near term action may work, but what do you do in 10 years or 20 years time? Well, but surely that that's, doesn't really follow, um, provided you are able to keep those, uh, those, you know, rewilded biodiverse ecosystems or whatever uh, intact. Um, now, of course, that is a big if, um, because uh, unfortunately, we're, we're likely to be seeing increased uh, temperatures and increased uh, climate instability for a long time to come. But I think that is what we have to have to try to aim for. We just have to try to get really, really serious about, for example, uh, making the, the uh, uh, making rainforests, you know, more rather than less uh, resistant to, to forest fires, uh, etc. You know, otherwise we, we, we probably uh, are finished uh, at some point um, yeah. this century. I still, I still think if we do the arithmetic on it, even if we regrew the entire uh, South American rainforest and the uh, Central European temperate forest and the uh, Northern British uh, forest then we would be nowhere near balancing the excess carbon dioxide we've stored up in the atmosphere since uh, 1600 or so from burning concentrated coal and oil and gas so there's still a big calculation this match and so well yeah that depends slightly like what your game as well as the, as yeah. the front game. that depends slightly what your target is doesn't it um and you know here we're getting into into almost the realm of fantasy really and you know, i wish we weren't but we are i mean are you are we aiming for 280 or 350 you know i'm quite happy aiming for something like 350 and i think aiming for something like that you know might be the kind of ballpark which is attainable by the kind of methods uh, i'm talking about but the the most important thing first is to stop it uh, carrying on from going up um and, and once again you know i do want to come back to the the sort of time mismatch that seems to be present for for ccs uh, we've got um, uh, um, solar and, uh, and wind that are in great shape now. The re research by Mark Jacobson and others seems to indicate that it's better for carbon abatement uh, and reduction to uh, invest in those now rather than in uh, CCS, and that will remain the, the case for a long time to come. The CCS, in terms of energy generation, appears to be an order of magnitude short in efficiency of where it would uh, need to be for it to work according to the kind of scenarios that depend upon it if for you know, ambitious uh, um, climate um, targets uh, dur during the middle part and later uh, uh, this century. Um, so given that, especially if we're thinking of targets like 2025 or 2030, you know, I don't, I, I'm, I'm struggling to see 
why we would be, why we would be thinking that CCS was going to have a significant role. Yeah, well, these I I'll reply on a personal basis, of course, that uh, because photovoltaics and windmills are quite small units, they're relatively low cost and quick to knock up and deploy. You can build a wind farm or a solar farm, and people are doing that, and clearly the the cost of doing that and the price to be made in the profit is is good. That's why it's happening. CCS is bigger and larger and attacks, uh, attacks uh, what tens or hundreds of windmills can do. But because it's expensive, it's never been built. But if, again, doing the arithmetic, that is part of the quickest way of descending in, in the emissions, unless we can convince the rest of the world uh, North America, Australia, Far East, rapidly industrializing in China, unless we can convince all those other types of countries to leapfrog past fossil fuels, not just for power, but for transport and for heat and for everything else. All of these, yeah. again, in number terms. Yeah, and really something cool. like that very ambitious idea is the kind of thing I think we should be trying to do. I think, you know, we, we need that reformist agendas were, were perfectly viable about 15 years ago, it seems to me that they're not now, that what we need to have now are genuinely radical, almost revolutionary uh, visions, visions of system change. We talk in Extinction Rebellion about a compassionate uh, revolution. Yeah, so could I ask you about that? Because you talked a little bit in your presentation about the urgency of uh, the situation and people, uh, professionals like people on this call uh, being truthful and talking about their perception in a way, being honest, however you like to use some words about that. But I wrote that down as trying to connect your professional conclusion with your personal action. Mm, yeah. I think a lot of people divorce those two. Yeah. So what would you recommend, uh, you know, apart from the usual things of writing to your MP, uh, how would you recommend people on this call to do something practical or should they be so moved to do so? Yeah, well, come and sit in the street with me and Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> that's the best one, but there are lots of things to do short of that. As I said, I think one thing which is really important uh, is don't hold back on, on telling um, policymakers, whoever, um, what you think the situation is and how desperate you think it is. And don't just stay stuck in the sort of box of thinking you have to do that in a sort of policy wonky kind of rationalistic uh, kind of way. Um, you'll probably add credibility rather than reduce credibility if you get upset about it or something. Um, but seriously, I do think that someone like Jim Hansen uh, is a hero here, you know, someone who, who um, um, set off the alarm about uh, uh, climate breakdown as a, as a possible future uh, in the 1980s. Uh, did a lot of the science himself uh, and has now on several occasions been uh, arrested for nonviolent uh, direct action um, for in the same cause. Um, and uh, the more um, we have uh, scientists and technologists and so on telling the truth unabatedly, uh, if I can use that metaphor, uh, and uh, uh, and, uh, and and matching it with their actions, uh, the better. You know, other role models here, I think, include uh, uh, Kevin Anderson, uh, who's, you know, very, very good at truth telling uh, and has given up flying as I have and, uh, and takes these long train journeys and all that. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, unless we get um, a really massive public and elite pressure now or very soon for the right kind of reset, then it's not going to happen. So, you know, don't leave it, to, don't leave it till it's too late. Don't leave it to somebody else, I guess. Don't leave it to somebody else, yeah. So at uh, 20 past um, four UK time, and Rupert said he wanted to go about half past, so I think that's quite a good place to draw to a close, If uh, unless anybody... There are a couple of comments in the chat, but I don't, with respect, see anything terribly fundamental coming up at the moment. So if everybody's happy enough, I'm going to say... Uh, Thank you to Rupert for uh, an intriguing and direct presentation and thank you for engaging very honestly and truthfully with the uh, plaudits and the criticisms and I think it's a window into a different way of thinking which uh, 
we should all wonder what we're actually really going to do about it. Yeah, and I would say also, you know, don't be a stranger. Uh, that uh, if you if you are uh, um, attracted by uh, stuff that I've said, or if you think there's some way you can contribute, you know, do reach out to Extinction Rebellion or whoever it might be uh, to uh, to try to connect up in that way and and make something exciting happen because, because uh, will be we need to do it now. <laughs> There is an extension rebellion close to you as well, wherever you are. You don't need to go to Norwich. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. We're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you again, Rupert. Okay, so I guess, uh, Karis, uh, you this gets archived if anybody wants to uh, review the whole thing. And does the do all the comments get archived as well? And the com it's it only videos the talk. It doesn't actually video the comments. Um, uh, we will have them if people wanted to look back. Okay. I shall just uh, copy and paste the comments so we've got them. Okay, so that's it. Yeah, thank you, Rupert. Thank, thank you very so much. Thank you very much indeed. And everybody can go back to their. Have a nice weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bye for now. <laughs>